Uh, it's an honor, truly, to be here. Uh, so I, as Sister Aferio mentioned, um, I am from the East Bay. What I'd like to do with my narrative is capture my mother's story, my grandmother's story, and some of my own story as a mother, as an African-American mother. Um, and I hope that there's benefit in it. I hope that there's um, change that comes out of this and inspiration to stand up for those who are unheard and stand up for those who are um, oppressed or um, disenfranchised and those who are being murdered, all sorts of uh, injustices that we're facing um, and we continue to face. I do believe that if we as a faith community are at the forefront of change and at the forefront of this conversation that it sets the tone and it sets the example for all the rest of everyone else. So I'm, I'm happy to have everyone here. Um, so I'll begin. Uh, I'll begin with uh, Bismillah, which means in the name of Allah, in the name of God. Um, I want to take you on a journey and the journey begins with my grandmother. So my mom is from Memphis, Tennessee, segregated South. Uh, my grandmother is from that same region, uh, Memphis, Tennessee, the segregated South. Uh, my mom grew up not far from the Civil Rights Museum, which is what's now a Civil Rights M Museum, what was before that the L Lorraine Motel, where Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated. So she's walking distance from that area. When he was assassinated, she was maybe five or six years old, still a child. But this was the era, the civil rights era that she was growing up in, which means that her mother grew up in a time before that where those voices were not even being heard yet. The call for justice and the, the courageous, bold persistence that we have a place in this country and that we have rights in this country, it was, it, it was not echoing as loudly uh, when my grandmother was was growing up. So there were two things that they were dealing with, not just being black in America, but being black and poor and segregated. The cross section of poverty and blackness was like a, a, a double, uh, I don't wanna say a double whammy, but a double hardship in terms of being voiceless and disenfranchised. And then when you add segregation to that, it's not that you're being segregated into the, the best of circumstances, you're getting segregated and redlined and Jim Crowed into the worst of circumstances. So my mom shares stories of poverty even more so than race and the difficulties of hunger. She has described going to school at times, all black schools, of course, because it's segregated, all black teachers, black mailmen, black grocery workers, all black everything. This is what she knows in Memphis, Tennessee. And her mother was married to a veteran. And when you serve this country as a black veteran and return to a country that still holds you as a second class citizen, it's, it's very damaging to the psyche, it's very damaging to the spirit. And he didn't fare too well. He didn't endure that very well. And he couldn't amount to much. So you're fighting for a country that you return to and you still can't amount to much. Um, he died at an early age, maybe in his 40s when my mom was a teen, which left then my grandmother, a single mom, a widow, five children, four boys and one daughter, and that one daughter is my mom. Uh, so all she had coming in was a social security and maybe some veteran benefits because her, her, her husband had died as a veteran. She never remarried and she just dedicated her, her life and what little she could to trying to raise these children in the segregated South. Again, not far from the Lorraine Motel. Now in, we look at the Lorraine, Lorraine Motel, maybe some of you have even visited the Civil Rights Museum in, in Memphis, Tennessee. We 
glamorize this place and we we hail Martin Luther King Jr. now and we are amazed and in awe by all of the contributions and sacrifices that he made. But at the time, you have to think the Lorraine Motel, as my mom has described it, this was a very seedy environment. This was not the best environment to be in. This is not, this would not, it was a motel. It was not a space that you would want to um, go to. We're Skid Row. You have, if you can imagine all that comes along with Skid Row and a motel in Skid Row, but someone of the caliber and excellence of Martin Luther King, when he came into Tennessee, this is the only place where he was allowed to to stay overnight because things were segregated. Um, my mom being that young didn't have memories of the colored only water fountains, but her, her family does. And her eldest brother has lots of memories. He's a tall, large, dark skinned man. He's growing up in the segregated South and you're, you're in an environment of poverty and all that they had at their disposal is you get your education and you have the church. That's your hope for your child. Get an education and go to church and you hope that God will somehow save you from these circumstances. My uncle said that in the home of most black families at the time, in a Baptist home, there were three pictures that you can find on most homes, on the, on the walls of most homes. You can find a picture of JFK, you can find a picture of Martin Luther King, and you can find a picture of a blue-eyed, blonde hair Jesus. These were the photos that you see in a black home. But the, in the, so if, if these are the images in, on your walls, these are the people you're holding in high esteem. These are the people you're hailing as your heroes, your salvation, your, your, um, your standard of success and all things great. So imagine a black boy then, if you're seeing a JFK, yes, you have your Martin Luther King, but you have an image of a blonde haired, blue eyed Jesus. He is the epitome of beauty and honor and salvation and all things. If this is what dignity looks like, if this is what salvation looks like, if this is what goodness looks like, then what does that make of the black boy? What does that mean for the black boy if the very opposite of your own image is what's considered close to godliness. And then if everything that you're seeing in the community of, around you is reinforcing that black is degraded and ugly and not worthy, what does this do to the black child? And in recent weeks, I've, I've interviewed my uncle, I've interviewed um, my mother and other relatives of that generation who remembered growing up in these conditions. Because for me, I didn't grow up in this, uh, but I'm always curious to know, how could you endure this? How could you, how, how did you endure uh, this level of treatment and still find the resilience and the faith to keep pushing forward and trusting that there's better for you? Um, he said that he would ask his mom. He would say, why do they hate us? He would go to his mother, black boy going to his black mother, why do they hate us, mom? Why do these white people hate us? Why do they treat us this way? Were, were, we, were we born to be despised? These are the kinds of questions a black boy is asking his black mom, who is poor and widowed and has very little opportunity. She, she got a high school education herself, but had, she took in clothing and she had to clean homes because this, these were the only opportunities afforded to her. What was her answer to this this boy who's who's crying out for some some to somehow reconcile this treatment? She said, "This racism is a sickness. It is a sickness, and if you act like them, you will become like them. So don't act like them." So when I hear this as a mother now, we have two burdens then to bear. I have to I have to bear the burden of being a victim of this hatred and the redlining and Jim Crow and segregation, but I also have to have the know-how and the, the dignity to rise above it as well. So I have to be plagued by this system and, and these illnesses, but I also have to not become like that and take the higher road and become better than that. 
how do you do this? Who, who, how, 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 can a, how does a young boy figure out how to navigate that and not react in a way that might be volatile or not react in a way that would crush his soul? It's an amazing thing to me. But my, 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 my family lived through it. They, they, they be within their family structure and the village structure and the constant reinforcement and a faith, a true faith in the divine on their own terms, they still were able to rise above some of these things. So the, by the time my uh, uncle and my mom, who's his younger sister, they reached their teenage years, uh, they, they started getting into some trouble. They were not your church going good boys and good girls. Uh, they have reputations that are lasting. In fact, we've gone back to Memphis in uh, recent years. They've gone back to some of the areas that they grew up in and we learned the nicknames that were held by my mom and my uncle. And I said, oh, okay. So you had a reputation that was lasting. Um, they, they ended up leaving uh, Memphis, Tennessee to Long Beach. Lots of African-Americans left to the North, to Chicago, to New York, to, there was mass exodus of African-Americans out of the South into the, the major cities across America. My family came westward to the Golden State. They came to Long Beach first. Um, and in Long Beach, for my mother, this was a, a huge culture shock. Because if you come from a world of black and white, but segregated so really you come from a very black world where you don't interact too much with white people and then you come to long beach california my mom went to long beach community college this is for the first time she's meeting people who are of a mexican background she met international students from africa she met um white people who were californian and who thought very differently than southern white folks um she still had her accent. So it was, it, it was clear that she was not from California. She still had her Southern accent. So she was still a bit of an outsider. Uh, and in Long Beach, since they traveled as a group, they sort of remained in those groups that they came in. But there was something in my mother and in my uncle as well as the, we had the rise of the civil rights era, we had Martin Luther King getting assassinated, we had M Malcolm X getting assassinated, we had this giant of Muhammad Ali who was all over screens encouraging people to be proud of their blackness and proud of being Muslim. They were introducing new terminology, Allah and Muhammad and uh, the, the black man is empowered. There was something about that message that um, awakened something in them as opposed to like, let's just bear through these injustices um, with forgiveness and turn the other cheek. I think they, they had endured that long enough and they were tired of it. They were sick and tired of being sick and tired as we know in a famous quote. So there was a rise of this nation of Islam, um, which I'm not, I don't know if you, you all it, it, know too much about it coming from the West Coast. Um, there were chapters all across America, and there was a message that was rooted in empowering uh, Black people, but on a theology that was a little, um, how can I put it, a, a theology that went to the opposite extreme in order to build the identity and build the um, the confidence and the greatness of a people. So instead of a, a, a white superiority, it became a black superiority and connecting blackness to divine qualities and godlike qualities, but rooted in white people being evil and devil. So it was just a flip flop. You would come from being taught that your blackness is, is bad or evil, but you flipped it to now we're associating whiteness with evil and blackness with goodness. Um, this, this only worked for a time with my family because for my mother, especially, I can speak for her mostly because I know her story well. Once she got to the book, Quran, and read it, and read the understanding of what a Muslim, um, how a Muslim thinks around matters of humanity and 
racism and injustice, there was something in that message that spoke to her spirit and reconciled a lot of those questions about how these things could happen to us. There was something that it didn't just empower her in her blackness, but it empowered her in her humanity. That no, whatever you've been taught in the way of your blackness making you three fifths human or any psychological and scientific records and studies that show that you actually originate from less than human. She felt that the Quran answered all of those questions and provided her a truth that restored her humanity and restored her faith that, okay, they got it wrong. They, they got some things wrong w when she was growing up and that was not her truth and that was not the right way to go about um, being a, a human being and then raising other human beings. So she embraced, initially she came from through, through that gateway of the Nation of Islam, uh, uh, civil rights era, struggling for justice, struggling to empower and bring the people for, out of, of darknesses into light. And then she found some tr truths in the Quran itself. And after the Nation of Islam kind of um, began to break off into different groups, the son of, of, of that leader, Elijah Muhammad, there, he, he had a, a son, Morthy Muhammad, who had traveled. He made Hajj. He, went, he studied in Egypt. He met members of the larger global Muslim community and said, this is the message I need to take back to my people. These are, this is the message I need to take back to African Americans. When we've limited ourselves to just this American box and American... Um, structures and racial just made up social structures around race if we can pull ourselves out of that to the global community we can restore ourselves not just as black people but as human beings as people of faith as people of um aspiring to reach god so this message many people my parents included so my uncle that i spoke of my mom my father they embrace this message and then they had us and that's that's where i get the name afra they they changed their names so initially this uh if i'll i'll show a picture so we add some context this the the widow that i spoke of my my grandmother that's her there her her name is luel beasley jeffries jeffries is actually her maiden name and beasley is her married name. Um, so one of the things that came with this embracing Islam was reclaiming vestiges of our past. It's known now through lots of research that many of the Africans who were enslaved in the Americas coming from West Africa were in fact Muslim. So with, by taking different last names and, and getting back to a last name that connected us to that legacy of West Africa, it was a way of empowering ourselves as well, choosing our own names and not the name of what would have been a plantation owner or a slave master. So my dad chose the name Abdullah. Um, my mom took that name as well. And then when we were all born, we were, we were given names that were Muslim inspired names, names that we found um, from Arabic Muslim name books or Muslim children's names. And I was named Afrah. And the Arabic pronunciation is Afrah. Most people will say Afra, but it means joy and happiness. I'm the fourth born of five from my mom. And um, this is not to, I'm talking a lot about my mom. This is not at all to dismiss or discount my, my dad's amazing legacy. I have to say that in case they see a recording later, say, why did you only talk about your mom, but you didn't talk about your dad from San Francisco? And for the purposes of this meeting, I'm just, I'm covering my mom's uh, journey because it's the memoirs of an African-American mom. Um, and our stories are unique. Um, our, 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 our fathers, our, my uncles, my brothers have a, a story of their own, but you know, so do the women. Um, so my mom had five. Of the five, 
I'm the only one who was born in Hayward. So I mentioned that I think to Penelope earlier, who's from Hayward, and a lot of you are from Hayward. So the intention was um, San Francisco. That's where they were headed. I was supposed to be born in San Francisco, but I was ready. I was born December 26. They had just been at a sort of an interfaith family Christmas gathering. Um, and at in the early hours of the morning, my mom goes into labor pains and they get on Highway 880 from Union City right there off of um, Alvarado Niles. So if you guys are from the East Bay, you know these areas, you know these highways. She gets on, I'm ready to go. I was born ready. So she has to get off at the nearest exit, Tennyson, and she goes to none other than St. Rose uh, Hospital. Uh, and that's where I was born, St. Rose Hospital on Tennyson. Uh, she, <laughs> my dad was parking the car. She, I was born on a gurney. I was ready to go. She'd had three previously. She was ready. I was ready. Her previous were twins who were born prematurely. I was born eight pounder. I weighed more than the two of those, the two of them combined. Um, and she delivered me on a gurney at St. Rose Hospital. And I always joke that I have an affinity for the Catholics because that's where I was born at St. Rose Hospital. Uh, so I grew up in and around the East Bay. So we were part, we grew up in Union City mostly, which many of you know, who are, if you're from Hayward or Union City, there was not much there. This was most, there's gladiola fields. We had cows on the hillsides. If you go hiking, um, at Mission, not Mission Peak, but uh, the one that's off of industrial, you see cows, you see gladiola fields. We're small town people working, but very, very diverse. Union City is a very diverse place. So we were growing up there, going to school there, but our faith community was in Oakland. So I, was, I grew up in a very African-American Muslim community and grew up in a very diverse academic setting. So the African-American community in Oakland, California was part of a war thing community. The, the imam looked like me, the doctors in the area looked like me, the attorneys and the lawyers and the community people. We had a very thriving community. So I had a reinforcement of positive images of African-Americans and I had very positive images of what our community should be and could be in the face of ongoing isms that we face. Um, Oakland has its, its share of issues, and it, all, it has, even while growing up. There's issues around poverty, there's issues around housing, mental health, um, dr drugs, homelessness, all of these issues that we're seeing now, if you take a visit or take a drive through Oakland, these, are, these things were present back then as well while we were growing up. But we were taught to be agents of change we were not, we were, we, were, we were told that we should rise up as the leaders to confront these things and be a part of changing these conditions in order to change our condition as a people. So this was the kind of the strength and empowerment that came through an African-American uh, journey through Islam, that it's, it's your duty. It's not just, um, we, we, you t we can't turn a blind eye. You have to stand up. If we're seeing things, we have to stand up for ourselves and stand up for other people, no matter where we see it. So coming from that community and then growing up in a very diverse academic setting, I went to uh, school at Cyril's Elementary and then Barnard White Middle School and then James Logan High School. And in 1999, we were the all-American city because of our diversity. We have people of all language backgrounds. We have people of all religious backgrounds. Uh, we had, you name it, we had it there in Logan. And it's, our, Logan is our only school, uh, like a little college. So we had to deal with matters related to hearing people's voices, hearing the voices of the oppressed, hearing the voices of people who are different than we are and getting to know people and being part of equality and justice and humanity for all people. Um, I would say that that experience where in one place, we moved a lot when we were little, but in one area, we lived in a condo. 
the upstairs neighbors, you can hear, you can smell tortillas cooking all the time. The neighbor across the way, you can smell lumpias cooking all the time. The neighbor in front, you could see just calm. She never spoke to us, but she would be doing her Tai Chi in the front, never spoke to us. We were, we were a lot of children and we could be a little rowdy, but, she, but this is what I grew up with seeing. Okay, so the Chinese neighbor in the front is in her, her centered space of Tai Chi. We probably made fun of them too, because we're children and this looks different and strange. But these images, uh, I think shaped my identity and it shaped my willingness to embrace all different types of people and be inclusive of all different types of people. So if your neighbor is Mexican and the family are immigrants and they're facing deportation, for example, you feel that the same way you would feel the African-American family who's just been harassed by the police. There's an empathy there because we're growing up together and we're facing some of the same struggles as people. Um, in terms of the police brutality, and I, I don't want to, I don't want to go on and on because I do want to make it interactive and have a space for um, people to share and ask questions. So I am looking at the time, um, but I would say what shaped my attitudes around police and those same questions that my uncle would ask his mom about, like, why are we treated like this? I would say uh, when the Rodney King uh, incident happened, I was maybe in middle school and we saw LA erupting in riots and we saw people across America taking it to the streets, protesting, angrily protesting. And I was trying to make sense of what is going on here. And this is when the conversation started. So the, here again, narratives in the lives of an African-American mother. My mom had two sons, three daughters. My eldest brother from her is a tall, dark, large African-American man. And when you see someone, this happened to Rodney King and you see all of the streets erupting because of this, it sends terror and fear into the heart of any mother. Because the thought is, I can't let this happen to my son. I, I, w there's a mother instinct that by any means you protect your son. So this is when the conversation started. Okay, if ever you're pulled over by police, you say, yes, sir, no, sir. You, you stand up tall. You don't make any sudden moves. You don't do anything that would make a person who might be having a, a bad day put bullets in you because because you want your son to be come home alive and you don't want him to be dead. And then and dealing with trying to get justice for your dead son because he fit a description. Those are the conversation that started when I'm 10 years old. And I'm like, so, so we're being hunted? So my brother's being hunted? So just because he's walking in his black skin, this puts him at risk? Why? How is this, how, why, what is this? I didn't know how to make sense of these kinds of things, but this is how he has to be taught. You, you say yes, sir, you say no, sir, you don't do, you speak well, you go to school, you do everything right so that you don't bring this on yourself as if we're bringing this on ourselves. As if by being born black is a crime that I brought on myself. This isn't, this, how can this be? This is, a, I, I can't accept that. I can't, but you go with it as a, as a young person. Once I got to high school, I remember I competed on the speech and debate team at James Logan High School. And my coach, Mr. Tommy Lindsay, he was our just, he was our hero. He was our everything as African-American students trying to navigate um, the academic system. In speech and debate, we did a lot of traveling around the country. I went to tournaments in St. Louis and I got trained in Florida. And I remember when I went to a tournament in Loyola, Maramont, down in Southern California, this was the first time that I said, okay, so this is what it means to fit a description. 
when we compete, we have to put on suits. We have to speak the best we can. We're competing against privately educated students. We're competing at a state and national level where most of the, the competitors don't look like us. And I remember at this particular tournament, one of my teammates is after the tournament, it ends for the day. We're all in our suits. We have to stay in hotels when we go to these different places. It's Loyola, Marymount. I'm in the hotel, girls are in rooms with girls, boys are in the rooms with boys. And I peek out at night from the hotel room. I see a police car, I see lights going, and I see my teammate against the cop car with his arms behind his back and he's cuffed because he fit a description. And this is one of the most preppy most he was not even african-american he was actually african immigrant and he had been taught you dress well you don't talk back you get it right you do well in school he was competing in debate he was one who would you you could not who wouldn't hurt a fly this this kind of wonderful guy and he's, he's doing great now but at that time i'm like he fits the description he's harmless we're here for a speech and debate tournament at our hotel, not doing anything, but he fit a description and you, you apprehend him and his, his chest against a police car. And my coach has to come to his aid. Listen, these students are here just to compete. They're not here for any trouble. He didn't do anything wrong. You have the wrong person. This wasn't the first time. I went to school, I graduated, I went to Santa Clara University. I told you I had this affinity for Catholics, right? I was born at a Catholic hospital. I go to a Jesuit university. Um, my second year in uh, living on campus, I had three roommates. We're all African-American. And this is a predominantly white institution. We are a minority. I'm African-American, I'm female, I'm Muslim, I'm a minority in every sense of the word. I, just, I'm not Catholic, I'm not white. I didn't come from an affluent background. Um, but my second year, I remember we invited some of our friends over to our place. One went to Stanford, one went to UC Santa Cruz, and another went to another campus. I don't know where it was, African-American males. And we're thinking, we'll just have a nice evening of who knows what we're doing. And we get called outside down to the parking lot of our campus apartments, and we see our friends apprehended and we see police vehicles and we see police officers because why are they in this area? You don't belong in this area. So we come to their defense. He's a student at Stanford. He's a student at UC Santa, Clara, at UC Santa Cruz. We're students here at Santa Clara University. They're our friends. They mean no harm. Why are they being profiled? So the, these experiences with my own brothers and my friends and my teammates and my father and my cousins, it does something to you where after a while you have to speak up. You have to say, come on, are we, just because you're not experiences, experiencing this yourself, do you not see what's going on here? Do, 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 do not see the profile and do you not see that we all fit a description and then we, Fast forward, and I'll, I, I want to wrap it up with, with this because the being African American and Muslim adds to the challenge. So I was very active um, in the Muslim Student Association at Santa Clara University. I actually didn't finish my undergraduate studies there. I ended up going to Fresno State and finishing up there, but I was still active with MSA and MSA West. These are, these are all student organizations that organize around faith-based organizing, and we're activists. Um, so we're always at the front lines of protesting things and defending um, our brothers and sisters. And th those whose rights need to be defended, you'll find us there. Because this was, we felt a moral obligation, more than just a social obligation and human obligation, just a moral duty to stand up. So after 9-11, which was a tragic, it just tragic event, we're, we're, we're just dumbfounded by what's happening here. We're viewing from California what's happening in New York. And that day I had to go to school 
I had to, I, I think I went to school and they ended up shutting school down. And the aftermath of that was just, it was mind boggling. Cause now I, I I'm, I'm African American and I've dealt with all of these different difficulties of the challenges facing African American communities. And then now I'm gonna face the challenges of being an African American Muslim woman in hijab. The aftermath of that was just, it was unbelievable because I felt the country just went into a reaction of these are our enemies. I think uh, I was told, go back to my country. I was told we don't do that in these, this country. I was put on no fly list. I remember I was headed to some event and I said, I can't, uh, why can I not board this plane? You're on a no fly list. You're going to have to get that clarified. Why would I be on a no fly list? So the, my identity as an African American and a Muslim have put me in a position of needing to be defended, but also having to stand up against people whose rights are being just completely annihilated. Um, I, I do feel now that I'm a, a, a mother, I'm, I'm totally fast forwarding here. It, it takes the, the, the struggle for justice and the struggle to make this world a better place for your offspring, it hits much, much deeper when you become a mother because your children are gonna inherit this world. Your children are going to inherit a future that my hope would be much more just and much more humane. I do believe that I've inherited a better world and a better America than my family came from, than my mother came from. But certainly we have a long ways to go for what I would want my daughter to inherit. We have a long ways to go. Her father is an immigrant from Jamaica. I would say that I, I never, I don't think I could ever really feel the challenges of walking in a black body until I walk next to someone who walks in a black body. And I see people clench their purses and I see people literally cross the street if, out, out of whatever fears because of whatever stereotypes that we've, we've conditioned people to believe about the expectations of a black male. And um, the fears of deportation, the fear that, oh gosh, there's added layers as a black immigrant. There's added layers as a Muslim immigrant when you have policies and you have um, a whole entire system that can ban you. You can ban a human being or deport a human being or segregate out this one belongs and this one doesn't. It's a, it's a lot of struggle that comes with that and a lot of hurt, a lot of frustration, a lot of pain, and sometimes it explodes into just rage. But I still, because I lean on my faith and because I do believe that there's always gonna be a group among us who will rise to the occasion of bringing justice and bringing the world, the balance and the humanity that we all deserve, I, I remain hopeful. And events like today, we're, we're a small group. I can only see like 21 participants, but I, I believe that a small group can do great, great things. And um, I consider myself a member of that small group that's committed to change and committed to standing up and committed to making a difference for my own daughter and for future generations. So I think I'll, I'll end with that. I hope I did not talk too long, um, but we do want to open the floor for comments, for questions, um, feedback. I'll let Rennie take over. Okay, so everyone has the ability to unmute themselves. So if you have a question, um, you can please unmute yourself, and then when you're done, remute yourself. And if you're one of the people that came in a little late, you can do a, uh, a little brief introduction. And uh, thank you very much, Afra, for that for a very powerful speech. And uh, I may have my own comments in a moment. <laughs> um, I'm 
Yeah. It's, uh, it's for real here. Thank you, Afrah. It was really a moving uh, presentation. You, you brought tears to my eyes and still, <laughs> it's, it's really wonderful to hear you. And I think we need a lot of voices like you to be heard. So we bring uh, humanity to the black struggle. Thank you. Sorry. Um, Sorry, I didn't mean to make you, I didn't mean to make you perfect. It's hard to share certain things without tears. It, 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 it really is, but um, yeah. So you, you, your family is still living here in, uh, in, East, in East Bay or? Uh, yes, so my, my mom is still in the East Bay. She's in Hayward. Um, my dad is in Union City. Uh, he's remarried, he and his wife are in Union City. I have a brother who's in Union City still, still near Kitty Anima Elementary School. But many of us have scattered. I have a sister um, who had been living in Jordan one who's in Texas and I have a brother who moved to um, Beijing and now he's in Shanghai. Wow. All over the world. Yeah, we're all over. <laughs> Hopefully making a positive difference wherever we go. That's our um, hope. Salam alaikum, sister Afra. Alaikum salam. I really enjoyed your presentation. I was wondering um, from your perspective, how um, does your faith and your spiritual practice and the words of our prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, um, impact your life on a daily basis and help you to overcome um, um, the impact of racism? Um, great question. Th and walaikum salam. Thank you. Um, I think when, first of all, I, I, I am a practicing Muslim, so I, I, I pray. We pray five times a day. So there's something about interrupting your, your affairs, whatever, whatever might be going on in your life five times a day to um, check in with God that keeps you, keeps you grounded and, and settled. At least it does for me, uh, because it's a reminder for me that there, this is so much bigger than just me. And um, that anything that we see happening, like those questions of why and how could this happen and how could God let this happen, that when I come back to prayer and I come back to take these questions back to my teachers, I find solace and I find answers. Um, and in terms of the Prophet Muhammad and, and his, his, uh, his message and his resolve, um, one of his final message, messages to his community before passing was that the white is not better than the black and the black is not better than the white. The Arab is not better than the non-Arab and the non-Arab is not better than the Arab. Like th if this, this is the final sermon to your people that deals with this matter, because this, this is not a modern problem. This is a historic human problem. This is not a problem unique to just America. I've lived outside of America. I lived in um, United Arab Emirates for a time and I, in Abu Dhabi. And what I saw in terms of racism there, or just the uh, almost what looked like a caste system to me, this is not just an American, unique to America, these, these issues, but that reminder, it's, it's almost like a recommitment every day that this, is my, this might be what we're facing, but this is a challenge to me and this is my obligation to stand up because at the very least you can change a thing we say that you can change a thing with your hands you can go out there and make a difference you can change a thing by speaking out against it and at the very least you can change it in your heart and there's sometimes i might feel very powerless and maybe others do too but god knows like in my heart i do not i cannot stand for oppression and i can because it's 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 worse than even death and there's certain things that I, you, between me and God, you know, I did not stand, stand by and, and watch these things happen. So those kinds of things uh, keep me feeling committed to um, a world that was intended to be a, a, a God conscious world um, of equality that that's promised to us. 
I hope that answered. Afra, Afra, mm -hmm. hello, this is Ramona. Um, hi, uh, I'm sorry, my internet band was low at the beginning. Mm -hmm. And what leaped out at me though was the story about the little boy in the South. Mm -hmm. Now this was who, I'm sorry? That's my uncle, my uncle, my uncle. And he went into a home where the three pictures on the wall were Martin Luther King, mm -hmm. John F. Kennedy, yeah. and a blonde, blue-eyed Jesus. Mm -hmm. That spoke volumes to me. Mm -hmm. That was a message that, how could this be? <laughs> you know, how could this be? Yeah. I asked the same question. So he, my uncle, Michael, that's his name. He's, um, he was a chaplain actually for many years. He retired recently, a chaplain in a state prison down in, in uh, Colinga, Central California. And um, we asked that same question. I'm like, okay, wait a second, uncle. Take me back to that because I'm having a hard time with this. So you're telling me this was commonplace in black homes. He said, you, you have to step outside of your 2020 California raised um, upbringing and try to put yourself back there. This was the norm. And I said, but how could that be, uncle? Like, how was, how was that okay? It's just what was. So wow. we actually, right after this talk, I, we've been having a weekly book club with our family, that, that uncle included, about Uncle Tom's Cabin. Um, wow. Because I kind of wrap my mind around some of these things, you know, and if, if any of you have read Uncle Tom's Cabin by Harriet Beecher Stowe, these are the kinds of things that come up. These are the conversations that were even coming up at that time. Mm -hmm. And he's giving us this historical context of try to put yourself back in those times. And I said, it's really hard, Uncle. That's really, it's hard. It's hard for me to, to, to accept that. Um, but it's, it's, um, it takes time. And one of the things actually in, in becoming, when he was with this, this African-American community, one of the things that Warthin Muhammad, the, um, our, our imam did was, he said, remove all images, remove all images of the divine. There was a, there was a whole movement. You know what, we're taking away, because we, uh, Muslims don't even have an image of Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, peace and blessings be upon him. We don't keep images of what he looked mm -hmm. like. Why? Because images are very, very powerful. They are. What we define as beauty and and angelic and godlike, it it can shape our psyche. I don't know if you guys have seen those studies where they have the little children looking at the black doll and the white doll, and they ask which one is prettier. So there, lots of studies have been done around the impact of of images and and stereotypes or degrading images compared to uplifting images. Wow. So we came from, I didn't grow up actually with pictures in the house, not even of our family, because we just removed all images um, and concentrated on the inner work of beautiful qualities that are inward. <laughs> and those being defined by character and honesty and, and truthfulness. And these, th those were what defined beauty for us as opposed to look at this, this image. Bingo. I yeah. agree with that 100% and thank you for saying that. Yeah. yeah, I want to ask you also, because I was listening today to Martin Luther King about why the African-American community did not achieve that much where other community from outside came and, and achieved more. Mm -hmm. And one of the things he said, which is resonate with me, that None of the other community who came to America, uh, you know, had slavery. You know, they were never been enslaved. So they never experienced that. So I want you to talk about how the impact of slavery, do you think, on the psyche and the yeah. spirit of African American and how it stopped them from achieving what a lot of immigrants, you know, came and achieved in this country. Absolutely. This, this, that's a great question. These are conversations that I have. Um, I, I, I'm surrounded by immigrants. So I, what I didn't mention is that I became an educator and I, I 
did my master's in literacy. So I taught students who were struggling readers and I taught a great deal of English as a second language, which is what took me overseas. Um, and, and then when I came back teaching English as a second language, I'm dealing with mostly immigrant students who are learning English as their second language, refugees and political asylees and um, people coming from different regions of the, of the globe, either by force or by, by uh, choice depending on where you're coming from. So the, the conversations that often come up with Africans, for example, because if, if we are considering ourselves black and we look at black struggle, um, even some Africans, and my, my friend Huda is here in this call, who I love to pieces. She's originally from Uganda, but came here um, by way of Sweden. We have these conversations as well. What differentiates the African immigrant, let's say, in, in their struggle, because they'll, they'll face some of the same struggles here as well, compared to the one who was impacted by slavery. And what I've said to her so often, and many of my other friends, is you, you still have a language, you still have a culture, you still have a country, you still, as, 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 as debilitated or uh, affected by um, war or all sorts of things, because people are coming from difficult, difficult circumstances. I, I acknowledge that. I fully acknowledge that. People are coming, uh, political asylees and refugees are coming from very, very challenging some circumstances. Um, but when you're dealing with people who have been cut off from language and cut off from family and sold as a as a chattel, like you, you have been reduced to being three fifths human. There's a very different recovery process, and a very different um, rebuilding yourself that has to happen through generations. Mm -hmm. That that maybe the person who's coming from an established nation who knows their lineage and knows their culture and their language has to overcome. So there's. Um, something unique was created in the cutting off of a people and bringing them to a new land and then mixing up with uh, other folks. And, and then the name that I have is not even the name that was my original name. If we go back before our history, before slavery, this was not our name. This was a name of the plantation owner. And the, the unique thing about chattel slavery, where you're, born into slavery and it's you inherit slavery so you, where is there where can you get free if you don't fight for your freedom so that the um that takes time that takes a lot of time even in in collecting of, of family records we've been trying to trace our lineage as far as we can go back because now we have lots of resources like ancestry.com to start piecing together lineage right and my mom has a relative who we call our family historian. She's been able to go back maybe like five generations. And census records show, even in the census record, there was term mulatto. So mulatto is a one that's a mixed. They're, they're black and white. So you've mixed up with sometimes even your own, the own slave master. This is your own child that you've enslaved from your seed, biologically speaking, I mean, right? But that person's born to a black woman, so that child is black. This, this is very, very damaging. So to go from that, and then when the U.S. itself is constituted on all human beings being equal, except this class of people who are three-fifths human, so I don't even have humanity. I'm not even a full human being. These things have had to be fought for from that time. Okay, first, I've, what, what's the other two-fifths? What am I, right? And then after that, okay, we've established our emancipation and Texas was late to get that notice. So we have something like Juneteenth because even though the federal government may have issued this emancipation, the states had to be the ones to change has been fought generation after generation to just establish first our humanity, then some rights to be human, then rights to be a woman, then rights to be all sorts of things. So it's, it's a, it's a very different kind of struggle. I know that was a long-winded answer, but the impact of that, and then anytime you, like in Oklahoma, 
We had a black Wall Street. So you rise up and you rebuild yourself and you come together as a people and then the whole thing gets bombed and decimated. Yeah. Right? So it's, it's, it's not just there was slavery and then that happened and it's done. And then there was Jim Crow and it ha it's, it's a, a revival of certain forces that are like you try to rise up against all odds and then you're still crushed. And interestingly, my, my, my mom coming here to California from the South, I, so I will mention my dad, in case you see this recording, he grew up in San Francisco. So his family came from near Austin, small town outside of Austin. They were really, um, his last name was originally Turner and my dad was named after Frederick Douglass. So these were fierce <laughs> fighting type people, yeah. activists, you know? <laughs> He, he, his, his father tried once to leave a sharecropping in Texas, it failed attempt. Second attempt, he made it to San Francisco and they never looked back. So my dad was born and raised here. And when my mom came, she thought, okay, we're in California now. We don't do like they do in the South. Like we don't have the same issues here in California, but that's not entirely true. The very city that I was born in, Hayward, was known to be KKK headquarters. It was known, and my mom my dad would tell her, like, there's certain areas we don't go to. You don't go to Castro Valley. You don't go to Hayward. You don't go to Novato, right? Having grown up in San Francisco, it's like you, there's, there's still, we still have that even in California, though sometimes we might consider ourselves uh, superior over those racist folks down in the South or elsewhere, right? <laughs> Thank you so much, Afra. Can you hear me? Am I? Am I? I'm not muted. Um, I. <clears throat> it's hard to express, but you have verbalized so beautifully the experience of your not only your family and yourself, but I. I think kind of a microcosm of um, African American experience in the United States and. You know the way that uh, the ways that you have dealt with it and your journey um, through Islam is really um, interesting and totally makes sense. And um, I just had one question in regards to that that part of the journey, mm -hmm. um, which was that you you know you, you kind of alluded to the fact that originally the nation of Islam had you know, was substituting one um, devil for the, for the other. Mm -hmm. and, and obviously you don't subscribe to that um, at all. So how did that change for your family or for you? Or? Yeah, that's a, that's a good one. Um, so I think um, if you look at, for example, the, the journey that Malcolm X went through, coming from that, I, he, he's, he's the most prolific figure, I think, who can, who captures that, that journey through yeah. faith and ideology and finding himself. So I think for, for my parents, I would say it was a similar kind of a journey where traveling, for one, I think travel is so very critical. My, both my parents performed Hajj mm -hmm. when I was still very young. And it was something that we, it was just expected from a, from a young age. You, you have to travel outside of just this U.S. box mm -hmm. and see your humanity in a global context, right? So that performance of Hajj where you have, and, and I've, I, I had, thankfully, I had the opportunity to perform Hajj as well. There's maybe, some, maybe you could explain. Some people here may not oh, know what Hajj is. The, the Hajj is the pilgrimage to Mecca. Mm -hmm. um, so there's in, in Mecca, Saudi Arabia, this, there's, this, there's the Kaaba, and that's, that's the direction we face when we're doing our prayers. This is the, the um, we're, it's believed, we believe that it was built by uh, the son of Abraham, his son Ismail, that this was built by him and this is this has always been a historic site a sacred space uh for not just uh muslims but uh people of faith dating back to abraham's time this was a this was a spiritual center 
And um, every year, Muslims make this pilgrimage. Unfortunately, not this year because of COVID. Only select pilgrims who lived in Saudi Arabia already were allowed to go. But normally, across the whole globe, everyone from across the globe is, is welcomed to this central point. So my father made that pilgrimage, I think, when I was maybe in middle school. And my mom, when I was, uh, after she'd raised all of us, and I was in college. But being there in this space where you see the blackest of the black, dark human beings of the earth with kinky hair and skin like midnight in all safe shapes and sizes to the fairest skin, bluest eye, blondest hair, and everything in between. I'm, I'm talking everything in between from abled body to disabled to people from villages to people from cities in, in the, the, the most advanced cities in the world. Everyone is there, millions of people together, all praying uh, one direction, one God, one, one family, oneness and all that. It cuts away at these notions of one being better or more superior than the other. So Malcolm X, having performed that Hajj and coming back as El Hajj Malik Shabazz, his solution was, for America's race problem was, we need Islam. We need people to understand in the, in the truest sense of it, not in the black man, God, white man, devil's uh, way that he had originally learned, but in the truest sense of, of humanity where all monotheistic, uh, why, I don't want to say people of faith, I don't want to say monotheistic faith, but people of, of faith and people of God consciousness kind of all arrive at that conclusion of this oneness. And if we operate from that place of oneness and connectedness toward the betterment of all of humanity, then we're getting somewhere. But when we're at odds and one's an enemy and one's, that's very problematic. If we've cast one group to be devils and one group to be like gods, this is a very problematic way of uh, approaching solutions for all of humanity. Right. Thank you. So, so the, at that point, your father kind of moved your family in a different direction. Is that yeah, right? for, for sure. He, he and, and my mother. I, I, my mother, my father and my mother. So this was my, my, my father um, was the only one in his family to actually embrace Islam and um, raise this with this new way. But my mother also, this, this was her, this was it for her. This was the answer. This was an answer. And this was what she instilled in us and cultivated in us and encouraged us in the way I, one thing I remember also growing up in Union City, in middle school, I remember I went home and I said, I'm the only black person in this class. Like, mom, what, this is a problem. I'm the only black person in this class. And her, her reaction was, so there might be times where you're the only one, but you, you, you carry on. So in, in my mom's, um, the, the way that she raised us, and maybe it's because she came from this very segregated world uh, she had, I think, insight and wisdom beyond what I could see when I was very young. And um, so it's, it's something that, that's still, it's, it's with me. And it's, it's the kind of diverse world, inclusive world that I want to raise my, my daughter in as well. Great. Mm. <clears throat> Thank you. You mentioned the Black... Um, Oh, you mentioned Oklahoma and the Black Wall Street. Um, mm. This is a history that um, a lot of people identify as white, like myself, have only been learning in the past few years. Um, mm -hmm. I think it's an important history that we need to, to, in order to move forward, that we all need to understand. But is that a history that you, that your family was aware of and always brought forward? Or was this part of what your father was discovering when he, you know, when he chose his own name and, you know, chose his own path and identity? Was it something that came out then? Or is this a history that's always been there for people of color? Uh, I would say a little bit of both. Uh, so because my, my father is from 
California. He's from San Francisco. He grew up in the Fillmore area, which was an African-American community, but went to school in Haight-Ashbury. I think the school is George Washington. Um, his, his experience was a little different than my mom growing up in Memphis, Tennessee, which you're, you're, you're hugging Mississippi, your you, deep South, deep South history. It looks very different than California history. So there were things, there was an awareness. So we grew up with, with certain stories and we grew up with the Malcolm X and the Martin Luther King and the Muhammad Ali and Frederick Douglass. So these were central figures. I had children's books of, of Malcolm X. I had, because my dad was named after Frederick Douglass, these were our exemplars. So this was Frederick Douglass being someone who he learned to read as a slave, learned how to read and was able to find his way to freedom through knowledge and literacy and uh, eventually moved to uh, moved out of the U.S. and became a, a prolific orator. So these were the examples that I knew of more knowledge is power, your education, your faith, your knowledge, your ability to speak, your ability to um, influence change. I think I, I'm only speaking for myself here. I'm, I know that my older siblings are much more deeply uh, Ed, entrenched and educated in more of these stories like Oklahoma. I would say even for me, there's certain things now that I'm like, wait a second. So there was a black wall street. So there was this, so th there's you, if you go, if you just grow up going to school here and learning your history here, you're not learning a black history. You're not learning a very rich, uh, a black history. And I, I learned the history of my family and the people that were central to our household, but even, um, some of these stories are, are, are new to me as well. So we've been, um, that's why we started, my older brother started a book club, like, okay, it's, it's time for us to wake up and educate ourselves. We have to be informed. And then not just informed, that informed has to lead to, to action and taking part in dialogue like this and educating the people around us. Um, yeah. So there's been a, a new series that we've been watching, The Lovecraft Country, which I think is ingenious because it slips in that history in an entertainment kind of mode so people even realize they're being educated. And I'm like, this is really great and smart and ingenious. <laughs> yeah. And we need all forms of that. We like these even today, this this discussion today, all of all the efforts uh, to inform ourselves and then inform the people around us, it goes a long way. It goes a long way. Okay. Thank you so much for, for being with us. I think we're probably coming to the end. Is there one, maybe one or one, one or two more questions or have we? Uh, I, I want to ask a question. You know, black women play, play a great role in the black family. What is the strength and the weakness of the black women in, 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 in the African-American, uh, you know, community? Hmm. In, in terms of like the role as a mother? Yeah, as a mother, as, you know, because seeing the, uh, most of the time when we look at the black family, it's always the women there, either single women or they are the mother and you find even the adult is scared of of their mother. I mean, they have a lot of respect and fear of her, more than you see their dad. And, uh, you know, so I, I understand it's partly slavery because the, the father used to be taken to be sold. The mother will stay with the kids. Mm -hmm. So so I don't know how, you know, what make African-American woman very strong in the family and what's her weakness also. She have a strength and she have a weakness. Mm -hmm. it's, it's what um, well, I, I can't, I don't, I, I would not want to speak on behalf of all African-American women and African-American families. I think one thing that's critically important is to not make broad strokes to generalize any, any group of people um, and challenging. So even, even in the, um, the title of, of this event, I said African-American mother, um, and even though I'm divorced, 
I didn't want to say single mother because there's certain mm -hmm. connotations that come with that and certain yeah. images and stereotypes of what it means to be this strong black mother and as if there's no fathers around and there's no dads around, like there, like there's there's no men in our lives. Um, that's a that's a really deep um, issue. It's it's a it's a misconception that I think gets perpetuated mm -hmm. because maybe um, people are comfortable with that with that image. I actually I, I I came from a divorced household, but my father and mother were very present in my life. I was raised by both of them. And they collaborated and they co-parented, and likewise with my own, my own uh, raising of my daughter. There's co-parenting and there's collaboration, uh, and I'd say that it, in the, in a historic context, though, there the mother is very central to the family, and it might come across as being strong and more dominant. And that the the man is less um, less prominent, but I I have very strong strong men in my family, so that's mm -hmm. not that hasn't that hasn't been so so much so that I'm I, I think I I've, I've had to try to be even stronger as a woman to confront male dominance. Um, I have very strong men in my family and very present in the lives of their families and their children, um, but in terms of of broken homes and um, women, single mothers, I would say that for, for single mothers that I know uh, who, have, who are still dealing with the effects of that, those separations that you mentioned mm -hmm. and a, an institution. So in part of the institution of slavery would be selling off families. Like, okay, husband goes there. Well, actually it was illegal to even be married, right? Mm -hmm. uh, we're, 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 a, a system that was just dehumanizing. So a, a family that's cut apart by a, a man gets sold off this way, a woman gets sold off that way, and a child gets sold off this way to different masters, wherever they may be. This can be very debilitating to any sense of family. But I would say that despite all those um, systems and those uh, challenges and those forces to disrupt the family, you still have a sense of a, a tight knit village, which is centered around motherhood and the warmth and the strength of motherhood and the women and the rearing of children. So mothers do the raising and the educating and the instilling values. And maybe the men are the ones who are the hunter gatherers, if you will, like you are the, you are protector and the maintainer of your family. Um, I, I wouldn't say that the vocal, strong black woman means that is indicative of an absent man. Mm. Uh, in fact, sometimes the, the stronger the presence of that, that black mother, that African-American mother, it's because she's, she's, she can lean on the strength of a very strong supportive man. Um, I hope that, I hope that answers it. Yeah, no, it's, it's wonderful. This is not at all to dismiss or discount the struggles of single mothers because that, that is a, that is a, that is a reality and that, that's a, that is a struggle in itself. It's just yeah. one that I can't speak to too well because it's. No, because as you said before, there is a stereotype about African-American mother. Yeah. And the absence of fathers. This yeah. is very, you know, you know, uh, you know, what you call it, uh, pervasive in the, in our society and yeah. the stereotype. Yeah. And and with that, I would say just always always challenge your, your those stereotypes and misconceptions. Mm -hmm. Know people. I think these are some of the best ways to to dispel myths and misconceptions, and is to to ask these kinds of questions and get to know people. Yeah, you, you see, when, you, when, you, when we hear voices like you and more of it, this is the only way we can get rid of the stereotype because you cannot get rid of it if you don't hear the voices and the story. Yeah. The story and the narrative, it tells you exactly, it, 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 it gives humanity to the people. If yeah. you're not, you just hear, you know, opinions and, and, and people propagate, you know, and different propaganda and you don't know what is true and what's, What's not? 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. Assalamu alaikum. Um, may peace be upon you. Um, this is Michelle speaking. My neighbor. <laughs> yeah. Oh, wait. Am I? What do you mean? Um, no, from WhatsApp, from MCC? Yeah. <laughs> oh my okay my name okay well i just want to say thank you so much to Safra. like that was that was so real and um very touching um and um i just the main thing like the main focus like how you're saying right now is for me also having a mixed son who's african-american and mexican so he i just want also him to kind of see the world you know differently than what his father and what his you know that his um african blood experienced and you know still like what's going on in this world Hi. um <laughs> yeah he's greeting you all so yeah i just definitely i you know i thank you so much for sharing that and i hope that um in god's will inshallah that you know we can exactly like keep um um, our African American neighbors and sisters and brothers, um, family can continue sharing and speaking up and like um, enlightening us and just keeping um, the movement alive and the change alive because. Um, yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Afra. Um, this has been a really um, wonderful, enlightening experience for me, and I'm sure everybody that's been here. Um, I'm going to let you close out. Is there any um, last words you would like to say to people as far as what we can do um, to help support uh, people of color who are especially Muslims, but not necessarily mm -hmm. um, us who are of different, uh, coming from the dominant culture, what would you like from us? I would, I would say, first of all, thank you. Um, this is a step in the right direction. These conversations, I think, join us in our humanity and we peel away the headlines and the, the, the notions that we come up with about each other and we hear each other's voices. So. Yes. Continuing these conversations and continuing getting, I'm just one of so many stories, just like Michelle said, there's, there's countless stories out there and connecting with people, getting to know people, just asking about as neighborly needs, how can we be of help and support and service? That's the best that I think we can do for each other. And it goes a long way in the grand scheme. Yes. That's perfect. Yeah. It's nice to reach other. Absolutely. Thank you. It was really a treat today, your, your, your presentation. It was really wonderful. Thank Absolutely. You. And thank you to everyone who who's, uh, came and, and listened and took it into their hearts, with all that Afra has said. So um, peace be upon all of, all of us, and um, let's go on with our lives.